All right, welcome everybody to this week's Grower to Grower webinar session focused on using beneficials to control insect pests in greenhouses, sponsored by UVM Extension and the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association. And people are still rolling in and we're waiting our uh, grower speaker to kick things off, but just thought I'd open it up and let people uh, put things in the chat or unmute themselves to just share what's on their mind? What would they like to hear from other growers about today as far as experiences using beneficial insects? And I noted that we have Margaret Skinner here from the UVM Entomology Lab, which is one of the leading university labs in promoting greenhouse IPM. Great website if you haven't been there. And a lot of experienced growers. So just kick it off. Maybe we'll start with you, Margaret, since we have you. Just um, what is plan this year for uh, education about greenhouse IPM. I know you just held the tri-state workshops last January. Is there something new up and coming growers should be watching your website for? Ooh. We've sort of been on hold in terms of interacting directly with growers, but uh, I think it's, I, I'm hoping that uh, as the season progresses, we'll be able to do more. I think one of the things that we do more than anything is work one-on-one uh, -on -one with growers. And that is primarily because what growers have said for many years is workshops are great, but really we need uh, someone right here to tell us what's going on. And uh, one of the key people is Cheryl Frank Sullivan. And She's considerably younger than I am and her eyesight is much better and she can find one aphid out of an entire greenhouse. Um, and so it's a love hate thing when she comes to visit growers because um, they know that she's gonna find things that nobody else does. But um, we're hoping to get uh, geared up uh, and that's about all I have to say. Uh, I hope people are starting to scout and planting marigolds and other habitat plants in their greenhouses to support natural enemies. Okay, Great. That's it. Thanks. And Pooh has arrived. Pooh, we're just <laughs> kind of polling the crowd to hear what's on their mind, um, which might sort of guide some of the things you talk about as you go through it. We do have something in the chat uh, about controlling potato aphids and um, that Phidia Servi is not showing many mummies after four releases. And maybe we'll circle back to Margaret to answer questions like that. Any other topics you like to hear addressed from your fellow growers and experts on the call today? All right, well, you can keep thinking. I'm gonna pull up the slides. Maybe we will address that one. Margaret, have you got anything to say about potato aphid control and Irvi not doing its job apparently? No, I don't. But now, one of the advantages right now is uh, the day lengths are longer. So uh, another option is um, a fidelides, a fidomyza, and that can work quite well, depending on what kind of an operation that you have. You know, the, uh, this particular fly midge uh, pupates in the soil, so you need to have uh, dirt floor or some someplace where they can pupate so that you get a circulating uh, a continuous culture going. So I would try something different. If it's not working, try something different. Uh, and why it might not be working, it, it, there's probably a million reasons, uh, whether it's temperature or um, whatever. I'm assuming that you actually got them identified and you're certain that they are potato aphids. I also would suggest that you contact your uh, uh, supplier. Yeah, try something different. <laughs> and I can see Tara is there. Tara from Longwind Farm has had a long history with uh, problems with potato aphid. I, I'm assuming Tara, you're not the one that's having the problem. Oh Are no, you? yeah, okay. no, that was me. <laughs> oh, what you? <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, we're just we're just starting to see that the four rounds of Irvi that we released weren't uh, giving us the results, and we're seeing just a couple small mummies again. But we did order a Fidelides and uh, Feltiella for this week, 
to and for the next four weeks to try and get that to be a little more robust. But the, yeah, we're not seeing the benefits from the Irvi again. And that's what happened the last time. Yeah. So you know what I would love, um, and this is getting a little bit technical and in the weeds, but um, <clears throat> the uh, TARS had problems with potato aphids before and yep. with Irvi not working. And we always wondered why, and the specialists, uh, the suppliers didn't know why. And uh, sort of after the fact, we learned about the fact that sometimes aphids have uh, bacteria in their body, which protects them from parasitism. Amazingly enough, you just gotta love this system. <laughs> And so unfortunately at the time, by the time we learned about that, and there's a guy down at the University of Georgia who can identify them. And um, uh, it, would be, it would be great to know if that's one of the issues that are going on because you can continue to release uh, parasites until the cows come home and it won't, be very effective because of that. So send, I would love it if you sent both some, some of the parasitized aphids and some of the non-parasitized ones and we'll send them down to uh, University of Georgia and figure out. You got it, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Margaret. Okay. So that's, Great to kick things off with some deep dives into aphids and we can circle back to grower questions and shared experiences after this. But Pooh Sprague, Ridgewater Farm, Plainfield, New Hampshire is gonna run us through a few slides about what they are doing for pest management using IPM scouting and introducing beneficials. And we've got a few slides here that we'll roll through and Pooh can elaborate on this. Welcome Pooh and thanks for doing this. Yeah, um, sorry for being late, Vern. Um, our operation has about 65,000 square feet of pipe and poly. Um, about a little less than half of that now is devoted to ornamentals in season. And of course we do like a lot of the vegetable farmers do, we grow a lot of in-ground crops, majority of which are tomatoes. Um, I'm glad to see you got Margaret on there. Um, everything I ever learned about beneficial <laughs> control, I learned from Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> occasionally send Cheryl out to, to, to school me and send me to the corner. I think I'm really wrong. Uh, I, am, I am by definition, uh, by USDA definition, a, a conventional grower, which means at, at the end of the day, when all else fails, I can go grab a bottle of some toxic, nasty substance to help subdue um, the problems that arise in a, in a very diverse operation that we have. And we can sort of see this is, this is part of the beauty of diversity. It also presents some problems in that we, uh, like greens growers, we, keep, uh, we create our own problems. We overwinter uh, some tropical plants and propagate uh, particular cultivars that we can't buy from larger suppliers. So two things happen with that. In the greenhouse, you're overwintering, you're heating, you're overwintering some nasty stuff, it hides. Uh, goes into diapause at low light levels. You don't know it's there. But uh, when, when the days get longer, all these problems arise. And the same thing happens uh, with people growing winter greens. They, you know, they, they put them in the ground and they come up, they, they grow, they row cover them. And then a couple of hot days, the first of March, when they really start to all of a sudden they pull the row covers off and there are problems. So um, we have a multitude of problems. Uh, I got out of the conventional application of um, conventional uh, conventional chemicals because we just began to realize that that they weren't working as effectively as as you know the the, the, the suppliers would like you to believe and the reason for this is is that on ornamentals uh, the stuff you buy in from 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 other growers or national growers or wherever you source fuchsias and, and things of that nature you you they're spraying too. They're spraying all winter, and they're not going to. They, they, those, those, that tray of whatever it is you bought from wherever it came from has seen every chemical known to man. So, all of a sudden, I was spending an inordinate amount of time ineffectively spraying things, and we particularly saw this with spinosad, or uh, I think 
the in, in trust is the name that that it goes by in the organic community. Um, scripts were not responding to it. They became immune to it in a matter of four or five years. So we started, you know, we when Margaret started off in the tri-state IPM things, we got on board and, and started to to incorporate beneficials and learn uh, and, and to use them in our greenhouse situation. So this 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 photo illustrates the problems. Here is a, a yellow card, a sticky a sticky card for monitoring. Um, it helps, it helps me a great deal. I can see stuff on the sticky cards and I can observe a problem usually when it's getting too late to treat it. Um, cause my eyesight, cause I'm an old guy. My eyesight's bad and I don't always keep my cheaters with me but I go through, I have these monitoring cars in the prop house. And uh, so this is what it looks like. Go ahead and run. Um, particular problem that, 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 okay. This is a, there's a lot of, a lot of cards graphs and diagnostics at the UVM website. And I think Bern took this in to illustrate, just help you identify what you're looking at on that, that card. You're looking at a host of things. You don't have one problem in the green, greenhouse. Quite frequently, you're looking at two or three possible problems. Our main problem this year in our greenhouses is two spotted spider mites and threats. Okay, change it. All right, this is, this is, uh, this is really the best tool for me. Um, it's a graph. I, I, I monitor my sticky car. I mean, I'm looking, yeah, obviously, and, you, and there's visual cues on plants that will show insect feeding. Um, but but this, is, this is what you find on the cards. The thrips respond very well to yellow sticky cards. And here I am every, every, 10, every 14 days, I go through and monitor you know, and write down what I find on my sticky cards. And if you really can't see it real close, this up here, uh, that's a that's a charge devoted to thrips, and so I'm not going to eliminate my thrips, but I want to know what's going on with my population. So I sort of chart how it behaves. If you look to the left hand side, you'll see that that not much is going on. You know, you're you're sort of lulled into 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 thinking everything is fine in your greenhouse because in in, in January and February, not much, they're not very active. Now you start to see. The days get longer. All of a sudden, your numbers—they're starting to wake up. They're starting to reproduce, and your numbers escalate. Uh, let's see. Next, yeah. Um, this is actually—you know—of course, you always want to show your successes. So this is uh, this is the thrips population as of uh, the, the 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 14th of March. And as you can see, it took a big nosedive, so it's really down at a low level. And I'm so proud of myself, and the reason. And this is what you want to see. What you don't want to see is a straight line curve going up, because that's what that's what normally can happen if you're not jumping on this and trying to trying to keep an eye on. It. All right, for the next one, Let's see what that is. Part of any kind of a beneficials program is feeding the good guys. These are marigolds that are going to be put out in our tomato greenhouses that are already planted. These these uh, marigolds provide not only habitat for beneficials that you're releasing. Uh, providing some nectar and stuff, but they also yellow is a good draw for thrip. So you can use this kind of a twofold purpose. Um, you can go in there and you know pinch the blossoms off and tap them on a white card and and sort of see. So we got do we got a bunch of thrips in here? Do we do we need to to do something about it? So uh, we use uh, to supplement mostly in our tomato greenhouses, some of our ornamentals. We use marigolds and uh, single pots of alyssum kind of spread out. The alyssum will feed the predatory wasp and such. Okay. Hey, Pooh, Margaret, any particular cultivar of marigolds you recommend? Uh, Cheryl, Cheryl said one time, you know, that, that I think it was Bonanza, Cher, uh, Margaret, uh, you know. Uh, well, it, we, one of the challenges <laughs> with the marigolds is <clears throat> uh, they keep changing the varieties. So we tend to use hero yellow. We, we did some research on different colors and really uh, thrips like all of the marigolds, but they like yellow marigolds the best. And uh, if you can get something like superhero yellow or hero yellow, that's uh, a good thing because the uh, plants remain uh, pretty short and are pr continue throughout the whole season. <clears throat> Yeah, this this series right here is, is 
you know, yeah. it also has something to do with what what is left over from 2020 that's still viable <laughs> and laying around yeah. the greenhouse. Because you yep. need to start these for us in order to go into these. Our leaders start at the end of January. They, our marigolds are pretty slow in the dead of winter, and we don't, you know, we don't take care of them. They don't get premium bench space. They get a cold corner. So um, I, you know, I just sort of default what is what to whatever is yellow and whatever is available at that time. So um, this is actually a, bo a boy series, uh, I think. I think it may be bonanza or what, or, or you know, it's whatever replaced the boy series. Um, another really good source of, of information of, of, you know, and it, it is uh, IPM Labs chart for, you know, general management, biological control for aphids. Pretty simple. You open up general management and they'll talk about, you know, you can use banker plants, you can, you need, you know, lower nitrogen, whatever, you know, there's that. And the biological controls on the right. So you can sort of familiarize yourself, but it really helps to, to either talk to uh, fellow growers to talk to Carol Glenister, the proprietor. She knows a lot about bugs, uh, rattle Margaret's chain and find out what's because because at certain times of the year, certain beneficials perform better because of light levels. They may be in diapause or, or temperature. Uh, for example, um, at this time of the year, I have a bunch of Brugmansias, which are a big trawl member, tropical tree kind of thing. And they, and we know the ugly guys are in there in December. We don't see them, but you know, I can't see, but I know there's enough spider mites. But in February, end of February, they start to, you begin to see flecking on the leaves and, and, and visual cues to know they're there. So it's pretty cool in February. So your choice uh, for us is a, is a persimilis because it's a much more aggressive uh, spider mite predator. Uh, it'll take down large populations, but the downfall of it is, uh, you know, it doesn't really sort of eats its way out of existence and you, you have to sort of handle it differently. When it gets a little warmer and you got your population a little bit chewed into, you can use Neocelius fallacious, which, which, you know, and which really prospers and does a lot better in warmer temperatures. That's the kind of information you can get from a website or talking to people who know. Uh, the same with, you know, fungus gnats, um, there's under general management, there's, there's cultural things that you can do uh, that describe how, you know, without even getting, that'll help you manage your population of, uh, of fungus gnats. And, and, you know, now we're finding that we've actually combined our fungus gnat control issues with our thrips uh, uh, issues, uh, our thrips control. So we're getting, you know, we're getting uh, a, a double use out of one product. Um, so these are very helpful. This is, this is actually our thrips control. We use uh, Steinamera Feltier. Uh, we start getting it in, we start applying it when we start, you know, this time of year, we start to use, you know, watering gets a lot more critical. I mean, you can, you know, you can, you know, sit at the desk in January when it's snowing outside in a gray day and say, oh, I watered up there, Christ, everything's fine. I don't have to go up and look at it till tomorrow. They'll just stay here and drink coffee. But this time of year, you got to visit the greenhouse a couple of times, get off the tractor and go there. So once you get into that kind of watering uh, situation daily, um, we start, uh, that's usually our just kind of visual, that's just kind of our chronological time to start applying Steinamera. Steinamera is a predatory nematode that, that you water into the soil um, and it searches around and when thrips pupate, they drop under the soil line and get down in there. And hopefully you have an established population of Steinamera, which we apply weekly. And, uh, and it, you know, those, those, uh, those nematodes are, are lying in wait for the thrips. And we're pretty sure uh, that we get pretty good control this way. Uh, you know, Margaret and Jack Mannix are the people who kind of encourage us to try this. It's worked very well. And we think we're also, we're less bothered by fungus gnats uh, every year that we have, have taken it on. Used to be, we had to order predators in for fungus gnat issues because there would be, you know, with all kind of long-term vegetative propagation, eventually you sort of, you, you can build up algae or they can just get over wet. And these guys work well in those situations. So, Steinamera is taking care of both our fungus gnats and our thrips. 
Okay. Well, and Poon, did you modify your fertigation in some way? Take off filters, or there are things you won't mix with the nematodes to make sure you don't harm them. We have a pretty, we have a, a, a filtration system that basically takes out enough of the chunk so it doesn't wreck the dosmatic. But um, it's it's not super fine. I used to worry about the filter being on it, but when I could take it off, you know, I'd run a thing and say, "Oh, I didn't take the filter off," and I went up and took the filter off, and it really wasn't that very little in. So, and I think I, I'm sorry that I'm not able to tell you what the mesh size is on it, but, but it doesn't seem so. No, it, this is like, uh, take it out of the, pull it out of the blue barrel uh, that has some, you know, blue junk fertilizer in it and, and drop it in the tank and, you know, uh, voila, pump away. What you see, the second hose there that you see in there, um, because these guys are live products, you have to, you kind of have to, Kind of have to treat them, you know, as such. And so one of the things that that they recommend that you do with your Steiner mirror is to aerate all the time. So got a little got a little fish tank pump in there, and the minute we set that bucket and mix mix it up and free the the Steiner mirror, that they, they're getting oxygenated at the same time. Yeah. Uh, what else I got there for pictures? Okay, pictures containers. Um, you know, people can find us all the time. You know, the amount of money it takes to buy your bugs and and uh, and the packaging and the shipping, you, you want to get everything out of that bottle as out of that bottle as humanly possible. So you'll you know, when you go around to people, you say you will find bottles, empty bottles of you know, Del Fastus bottles, uh, Persimilis bottles with the caps upside and sometimes even purchase on the plant you know you want everything to get out of that bottle to get out and do some work so they come in a variety of, of packaging as a matter of fact i read uh in a in a blog um that that in fact packaging during covid has been uh has had to get very creative because there a lot of the suppliers um i want to say the the, the north american suppliers are having trouble you know uh, acquiring the plastic packaging that they know it's very unsystem it's, it's, there's not there's not a particular package that um see there's a different shape it you have to read what's on the bottle to, or the package to understand clearly what's in it there's no there's no uh, there's no correlation between bottle you know bottle shape and, and what's in it and, and and some of these things you know you, you they come in the mail um they need to be refrigerated and handled right off. And you should, you know, you should check. Like we use a lot of fiddle eaties. Um, that was one of Jake's deals, got me going on it. And they are basically a, a, a wasp that, that lays a larvae that's parasitic. So you when you get a box of fiddle eaties, um, you have to you have to leave it in a warm place until they hatch and then make a release at that point, much as you do with uh, aphidias. Um, so we've got, you know, we have tubs of aphidolides and, you know, that live on the mantle, you know, over the wood stove. And, you know, we keep an eye on them and we go out Sunday evening. And, and that's the other thing is, it's really, you know, you learn more and more all the time about what do you do when you release them? You know, a lot of things, you know, like in Carcia Formosa cards, you can you know, just take those out of the package and see somebody around to, yeah, you, know, you see them hanging on tomatoes. You can, you can just peel off a couple of those rascals and hang them as soon as you get them. Uh, the other stuff, it's not so easy. The the aphidias um, and the aphidolides like to be reduced, like to be released in the evening. And there usually should be some moisture around so that they actually, when they're flying around, they have access to, to, to flying over, you know, to, 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 to take a drink or whatever. So frequently I'll just go in with a misting nozzle or, you know, and, and, and blast a bunch of water around, relieve them. The other thing to do with these little wasps uh, learned over the years is if you have circulation fans, um, it's, really, it's really a good idea uh, to shut all your circulation fans down for a couple of hours so that they can fly around, get um, they can get acclimated, or or start hunting, or do all any of that that kind of stuff. 
uh, Brian Spencer told me, he said this, uh, that, you know, if you leave your, leave those fans running when you're releasing a fiddle, you know, a fiddle edies or a Phidias or any of the parasitic wasp, you are, you're going to, you actually get a lot more, uh, get a lot more kill from it than you really, than you really want to have. So he said, you just by shutting off uh, uh, circulation fans or fan jets for a couple hours at night, really uh, gives them a leg up as well. This is, uh, I believe, Margaret, check me out. This is lacewing. Yep. Lacewing larvae. And we, I don't use them a great amount, although I've got some coming this week. Are there people that swear by them? Uh, we're all trying to get a leg up on the aphid situation. I've had a couple of inquiries, people saying, what happened to the ladybugs? And what happened to the ladybugs is, um, they got over harvested and there was a drought last year. A couple of years ago, there was some public outcry about people going up into the Rockies mountains and harvesting ladybugs for sale. And they felt it might be uh, damaging the, you know, the native populations of hippodamia. So that's why this year they're, you know, they're, they're approaching it with a lot more caution. Uh, Carol said that there'll be some uh, lady beetles, ladybugs, available by June or July, but you know, we don't have a, if we have a problem before then, you know, we have to be more proactive and uh, get some stuff out. The charts, there are, there are various forms and charts that help you, you know, help you scout. I think one of the best, best things you can do is, is send your help to, to Margaret's uh, tri-state IPM meetings uh, a couple of times because they're really the, the, the eyes on the ground when they're transplanting. For example, I'm kind of sequestered off in a prop house, you know, away from the main retail houses that you saw on the opening slide. So I'm really not down there. I mean, there's stuff is coming and going and machinery going on. And I, I tend to, you know, be taking cuttings, seeding and dealing in a completely different eyes. You want people down there who know, knows what that bug is. First of all, they can identify it. And then, you know, they get a feel as to how populations react and respond. Um, it's great information. You don't want to hear it. But when Sarah calls them and says, hey, Dad, I hate to tell you, but you sent down some extended drains. You got aphids on them. And you know what happens in another month? We don't deal with those. And, you know, and that, that's a, that's, you don't want to hear it, but that's really invaluable uh, information. And it's really important that, you know, it's okay to have worker bees, but smart worker bees who are watching out for the bugs and stuff, that's really, that's really helpful. And you can also train them so that they, they monitor what's coming in. Because going back to the thing, you're buying pests a lot of times. You know, we have, there are various greenhouses that we buy from that will remain unmentioned. We, 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 when we, they come off the truck, you know, they, they get checked out, they get, they get tapped on a, you know, those those plantlets get tapped and checked for, for whatever, whether it's thrips or aphids. Um, and that that's that's a good time to nip it in the bud. There are things you can do. Maybe you don't want to, you don't, you can, you know, you got 80, 100 feet of bench space. Pretty easy to put a backpack sprayer on, go down with some azotractin and stuff and give them a shot at that point. Once you plant them out, you know, you're dispersing your problem and it gets significantly hard. Yesterday's call was, you got to spray a strobilurin on the, uh, you got to spray a strobilurin on the hanging baskets of begonias for powdery mildew before we hang them up. And that's because it's a lot easier to do it when they're on the bench than when they, they, get, um, they get put up. There's a picture of ladybugs, right? My, oh, yep. no, my cheaters, Fern, that ladybugs? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what, but medium, uh, usually they come to me in a muslin bag. And the nice thing about ladybugs is you can order a pint in, stick it in the refrigerator for quite a long time. Our, our biggest problem annually is at some point, uh, an aphid somewhere in Sullivan County will get into the transplanted peppers. And that'll be about, you know, May. And, you know, at that point, they're not only reproducing asexually, but they're they're also produced flying and producing sexually and moving around. So ladybugs are a great cleanup thing. 
Um, we like to have them around, but you know we're going to have to operate without them this year. So we're spending a little more money up front on a fiddle ladies uh, control. So we do have occasional problems with uh, on these uh, somewhat exotic <laughs> plants we have with mealybug and scale. Uh, Cheryl has, has uh, excuse me, bitch slapped me upside the head enough times. <laughs> You need to just take these things out and throw them over the bank, no matter how valuable you think they are. And so that really is the only control. There are controls for mealy bugs, supposedly out there. We have not found them to be very, it's a, I can't remember the beetle's name. Ends with C, Margaret. Uh, anyway. Oh, cryptolemus. Yeah, cryptolemus. And we've never found it to be very satisfactory or very, um, very effective. And our reason most, and, and say it with, with mealy bugs and scale as well, because these things, they just, they, you know, we used to, I used to try to go through and spray with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of alcohol and, and soap and kill all the stuff on the plants. The plants are, look great, but you've got all this stuff in the soil. So those are problems we, we, we don't even, the minute something shows up with that on it, just goes over the bank. So we use, that's the control for that. First, for, for uh, spider mites, two spot spider mites, we use um, uh, persimilis if it's a hot spot. Um, we use fallacious pretty generously on, the, on those particular crops that we know are going to be problems. For aphids, you know, we're, we're using aphidias and aphidolides. Uh, in the past, when we were able to get hippodamia, we keep some around if we need that. And the peppers. Uh, Entarsia formosa, pretty much exclusively now for white fly. And uh, we have apply it generously in the tomato greenhouses. And I think this is pretty much a given that uh, it's a pretty, simple, that's a pretty simple and effective thing. In the past, I've had buildups and hot spots with uh, white fly in the ornamentals and Delphastis. Is a, is, a, is, a, is a fast moving beetle that will, will clean up a, a white fly scale and, and get your population um, knocked back pretty well. And I think that's, you know, unless somebody's got specific questions. So let's uh, open it up. Is, is, is for effective, you can get answers to questions, but what is fundamentally the most important part is ex experiential experience, and that includes the failure that goes with your experience, you will, you can sort of historically know what you're going to inspect to see in your greenhouses at a particular point in time. And because you can't, it, it, it's important to realize if you see a problem, you're way behind the curve with biologicals and beneficials. So it's also good to, to, to understand there are bio-rational materials that you can spray that are, that are not going to are not going to kill the, the, the beneficials that are out there, but will also knock back problems for you so that your beneficials can be reintroduced or get reestablished. So that whole historical context from which you operate is, is really, really important. And it's also, also life cycles, life cycles of these things. And this gets into entomology and God knows I am, you know, I never, you know, somebody said, 50 years ago that I that it would be important to what I do I, I would have laughed about it but you have to learn something about the life cycles of your of your good guys as well as your bad guys you, and there's good news about that too I was talking about boy I said to Brian and said I spent an awful lot of money on a fiddle eaties of shipping is is really expensive and he says yeah but you know the the upside to that he says you're establishing they overwinter in New England you know they fly a oh, minute you open your 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 roll up your sides they may be escaping, but they're also coming in because, you know, you you you're a, you're they they overwinter. So, and as you know, you've always you know at the end of the season, you've got I've always got some plant that comes in full of little brown basketballs. That's nothing I did. It's just there. So, are Pooh, let's there. uh, yep. let's uh, we got some questions in the chat, and I I did just show the UVM entomology website. If you haven't been there, totally awesome with regard to insect pest management in tunnels. And the other site I often look to is UMass has a great greenhouse and floriculture site. Um, unfortunately, maybe Margaret, you know, but Tina Smith, folks that put that together have retired. 
a lot of the stuff is oh. still quite relevant. Huh. Um, but um, those two sites um, are very helpful. And like I showed earlier, who showed, you know, sometimes there's two different kinds of scouting forms. You can find one on each site, pick, pick the one you want. There are a couple of questions about nematodes here. I'll just uh, ask one. Someone commented about Elson Shields' work um, at Cornell working with um, nematodes in the field, but finding that chlorinated water would kill them. I'm assuming that could be an issue in tunnels. What's your recommendation, Margaret? Will will you know tap water? That level won't be a problem, will it? Well, tap water depends on whether where you're getting your tap water from. If you're getting it from Burlington, it'll have chlorine in it. Uh, so you have to be careful where you're getting it from. Again, I would talk to the supplier. They're the ones that really should be able to tell you how to do it. I think, you know, there's some stuff you can do maybe where you uh, let the water sit overnight and the chlorine, the chlorine uh, evaporates or whatever, um, but I don't know specifically. Um, the, the one thing I will, I think it's worth men mentioning. So who is like an advertisement for what we've been doing over the years? And um, we didn't have to pay him. Uh, he has learned this over time because Cheryl would come down and work with him. And every year he would learn something a little bit different to, to think that he's, he's got those graphs and oh my God, it's the most exciting thing. That's what people should be doing. And maybe they won't do it all in one year. I mean, look at how old he is. It's taken him, <laughs> it takes a long time to put all the pieces together. And what Pooh is describing is what he's done over time. And um, he can, he knows the scientific names of the different natural enemies a whole lot better than I do because he's working with them all the time. And all of you have the ability to, to learn the kinds of things that Pooh Spray has learned. Uh, I mean, he's a, he's a poster boy for uh, uh, IPM, really. And, and some of that is because we held his hand for several years. And now he doesn't need our hand anymore. Uh, so it's exciting. And the one other thing, have you ever tried neem on mealybugs and scale? I, I've used it just for my little house plants and I've been impressed at how well it worked. Just as an aside. <clears throat> and I know we've got some other experienced beneficial insect users in the on the call here. Jake Guest, I saw you there. You've been using these for many years too. Do you have anything to, to add? And there. if people have questions, did you un yeah. type them in the chat. Yeah, okay. there you are. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I just said a couple of things. And I, I, who didn't mention, maybe doesn't do it, but <clears throat> the, the, the grass the, plants. The grass aphids. The yeah. grass aphids. Um, you mean banker plants. What? Yeah. yeah. Banker plants. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> We really got pretty efficient at that, and it worked really well. Um, uh, Except we'd it, yell at we'd yell at Jake when he put them in the greenhouses that had the ornamental grasses. But <laughs> <laughs> so that was is that Pooh didn't mention that. I don't know, Pooh. You I don't know, have you been doing that or? He said he's not using banker plants. I asked him that the other day. I know Jack okay. Manix does. No, you know, I'm, I'm, I may be a poster boy for some things, but I'm on Carol's Lannister shit list. Um, uh, <laughs> Jack uses them. And, and I, so as I said to right. her, and I said, uh, uh, so many, so much stuff moving around our greenhouses. Um, it go, you know, you, you know, it, it goes, cuttings go up above, they go back down, they're in four and a half inches pots, they're moved over to a retail house, and then it get moved someplace right. else. We have a we have problems, you know, with logistics for sure. Um, it's just a system of management. I'm not. I wouldn't be good at. Jack, being a detailed person, or uh, and yourself, are much more adept at that. Um, the hyper parasitism thing scared me some, and I just thought, you know. I, I, hey, Margaret, do you want to give the yeah. quick overview so okay. people know what you're talking yeah. about? Aphid banker plants are. Uh, and an aphid, a non-pest aphid species called bird cherry oat aphid will grow on uh, oat 
and wheat grass, you start a population growing on that wheat grass with the bird cherry oat aphid, which you can purchase from IPM labs and some other places. And then you, once you get that culture going, then you put it out into the greenhouse, then you release your natural enemy, your parasite, and it will make sure that you have a host for the natural enemy when you release it, because it, the whole key to biological control is you got to get the natural enemy into your greenhouse early. But if you don't have any aphids for them to parasitize on, then you sort of don't make any money. This way, you can get the population of uh, parasites going. <clears throat> and then when the pest comes, because the aphid pests will always come sooner or later, then you've already got the parasites in your greenhouse uh, ready to go. Uh, <clears throat> it is, it does, it's kind of cool. It, you know, if you're into uh, zoo management, um, it's like <laughs> having a little, a little culture, uh, your little pet aphids, but you got to like doing it. <clears throat> and some people really get into it and they enjoy doing it. And it's, it's, it provides a prolonged low cost uh, biological control approach, but it's not for everybody. For people that are too busy, ah, the aphids will die or ah, something will get screwed up. So you do have to be careful about how you use it. Some people swear by it and some people swear at it. <laughs> well, I, I swear by it and I, I, I know it is kind of a pain in the neck. There's all kinds of weird problems like like if yeah. you if the if you if you put the pots on the bench and the leaves bend you know, the an ants get into it the yeah. ants will definitely get into yep. it but we we I I would get so many of these things going that um it would just I mean there were aphids everywhere for whoever came along so I I also noticed it was drawing in uh like hoverflies, you know, and it, it, and it was bringing in stuff from outside. As soon as it got warm enough, we were opening the sides. You know, there were all these other other predators that, and, and and parasitoids and stuff that were that were coming in in response to the the fact that all these aphids were there, and and they would and there were so many of these uh, aphidias around that. Um, as soon as there are any aphids anywhere, except foxglove aphids, that's another issue. But anyway, they would uh, immediately get get parasitized. I mean, it was really quite dramatic. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's, an, but it is, it's, it's, it's tricky. And and who's right? There is hyper parasitism and so forth. Uh, just one little hint: if you uh, oats are not as good as wheat because the oats tend to flop over and uh, the wheat stands up better. But anybody who's interested and wants to give me a call, I'd be glad to um, share my experience with it. For whatever it's worth, we tried it in high tunnels. And, uh, <clears throat> and in that particular situation, the, the plants were put on the ground and oh, no. <sighs> this yeah. didn't work. <laughs> Um, we, we would lose those, aph we would have a plant that was inundated with uh, the bird cherry oat aphid, not the pest aphid. And <clears throat> within 24 hours, the aphids would be gone. Um, and I think it was the ants that would move them somewhere yeah. else. <clears throat> yeah, we would put, we would put <clears throat> yeah, dishes yeah. of... Uh of uh, water in the whole, it was pretty elaborate, but I, but I, think, it was, I think it was worth it. I really, I really yeah. think it was worth it. You know. Again, the, I think IPM and biological control needs to be tailored to the individual grower. And so part, some of that is what kind of an operation you have, but also what kind of time you have. Do you have the time to invest in, in uh, banker plants, or do you just need to go and buy more aphids, parasite, parasites, or whatever, and just be done with it? <clears throat> so you just have to pick pick your battles and go from there. So there's a question I, I in the chat. Uh, for, I? I guess for all of you experienced IPM folks <laughs> in tunnels, do you have a flow chart that helps you make decisions for what to apply and when? Like you see this pest. Then what's the temperature, what time of year, pest density, or do you know of resources like that? Um, some growers uh, 
get really good at this and they develop a whole calendar in December or January because they've kept records for years and years and so they know when they're going to start seeing thrips or start seeing aphids or whatever because it always seems to happen at the same time give or take and so they know I've got to start releasing these uh, natural enemies at this time in anticipation for this particular target pest and they the the suppliers love it because then they know what to plan for. And it's also good because you, you become a high priority customer because these days there are so many people that want natural enemies. Uh, sometimes the suppliers run out. So if you're already on the radar for these suppliers, that works very well. And so, but when you say, is there a, a table that has what temperature and time of year and pest density. It's really hard to put all that information into a little table um, for all the different natural enemies. There's so many different natural enemies that you can choose from. And that's why working with the supplier is really good, developing a relationship. Uh, the one other thing that we often recommend is don't, don't use just one supplier, use a couple because they're all a little different. And they have different kinds of customer service and and uh, some people really like calling IPM labs because usually Carol is right there and she can say yeah you should do this that or whatever. Um, some of these other bigger companies may have more supply but they may not have as good customer service or individualized attention. So it takes a while to develop it all. So there's not tons and tons of suppliers maybe people could put in the chat suppliers that they're working with that they uh, would recommend. And I, Jack uh, put something in the chat about banker plants, but rather than yeah. you say, Jack, do you want to just share what's going on with your banker plants? Yeah, can you hear me now, Vern? Yeah. Okay, good, yeah, sorry, I'm late to the show. And when Pooh is presenting, I make it a priority to drop everything I'm doing to <laughs> attend. So uh, <laughs> Daisy is here too, and uh, she will feed me the information as she knows more than I do. But uh, we, our major problem is the foxglove aphid. And um, we had been getting Irvi, which are very expensive as, as opposed to the other aphidias. So we talked to Carol about possibly uh, raising banker plants for the Irvi and she suggested fava beans. So um, I hadn't heard that before. So we're, uh, we're, we'll be working with her on that and um, adding that to our banker plant sort of inventory. You know, Jack, uh, we tried to get some funding to do some research on that, and we didn't get funded. So it's too bad. I'm glad that you're working on it, though. Good. Well, I'm doing it for free, but if you would like to contribute, <laughs> Margaret, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's I think Jack, it, uh, Jack Mannix at Walker Farm, for folks that don't know, and you've been using banker plants for a while. Um, you have lots of tunnels. How many, can you give us a number of how many um, Banker plants, you know, you start and kind of which houses you put them in? Uh, Daisy, how many do we start? We, well, we start probably, I mean, about. I, like, uh, I, I start them, we kind of do it a little bit differently. We have these tents. And so I, I, each tent holds 12 banker plants. And I have one tent where I put them in with the aphids and I let the, and I, and I put the grass and I let the grasses get populated with aphids. Then I put them into the next tent where we um, release the parasites into the tent. And then the population grows within the tent. And then once I can see that the grasses are populated with parasitized aphids, then we move them out into the different greenhouses as we need them where we have pressure. And then we also can, um, for example, if we're going to release um, lace wings or ladybugs or something like that, we can put the banker plants back into the tents to protect them while we release these other predators that will kind of eat everything. And then, you know, wait for a couple of days and then um, reintroduce the banker plants. Um, and so I kind of always am moving and then the, and then eventually the banker plants are just shot and then we just throw them away. But so every, I, it's kind of a schedule. I start them, I get them populated. I move them to the next tent, get the parasites on them, then move them out. And then I'm, you know, it's kind of a continuous thing always going on. 
Great, thanks. People are putting some names in the chat so you can see Sound Horticulture in Washington State, BioB, Similis, I don't know where that is. And someone earlier mentioned they were getting ladybugs direct from a breeder in Colorado. If you have names you can name, be good to put them in the chat so people can follow up if they want to. Any other questions on your mind? So if people are interested in uh, getting some support services from us at the, uh, at the entomology lab, you should send us an email and we'll see whether we can add you to our list. <clears throat> and what criteria, in, you know, how far will you go? And are you looking for certain, you know, size of production or anything, or is it just case by case? No, nope, it's a case by case thing. We do like, at least conceptually, we like, we don't want to just work in Chittenden County. We usually try and find uh, two or three growers that aren't too far apart so that when we do the trip, uh, we can uh, do more than one, hit one place in one location. So usually what it involves is uh, Cheryl comes down, checks out the site, comes up with uh, what objectives you have for uh, improving your IPM program, and then we work with you to make it happen. <clears throat> so I want to bring up one big topic. We don't have much time left, but it's been discussed quite a bit. You know, there used to be more of a winter break in tunnel production, and people did various things, uh, you know, freezing, drying things out, obviously cleaning out all the green living material. So when things emerge after the winter, they would not prosper and hopefully starve. And with um, lo longer and longer growing seasons, you know, winter greens in particular, following tomatoes and lots and lots of houses and like poo situation, ornamentals <clears throat> coming in, it's just not much of a break anymore. Is this, what are, what are your thoughts on that, Margaret, or other growers of how necessary is some interruption and how much of a problem is it that there's no break in living material being present in tunnels? Uh, I think it, it means that you have to be even more vigilant in terms of uh, keeping an eye on pests because they're probably always around. And it would be lovely to say, okay, you got to leave your high tunnel fallow. I, I just don't think that's happening anymore. Um, and I also think it's interesting the you know, now people are not doing the, you know, now there's the different kind of rototilling where you don't chop things to smithereens. You like to keep it, I don't know what they call it. Anyway, it's minimal tilling anyway. And that may be great in some respects, but it's also great for making sure that there's lots of organic matter, lots of plant material around for the pests to linger on. So um, it just makes for a different sort of set of circumstances to keep an eye out for. Vern, one of the things that, that uh, UVM did down here was they, the, the, they pursued the idea of how much benefit you got by having fallow. Uh, they ran experiments for two or three years um, where they, they had thermometers about. We had one couple of houses that were clean as a whistle and we monitored that was what they were looking for. And they found, much to their surprise, that uh, there was a resident population of thrips on a fallow greenhouse that emerged on a warm day in February. So the next year, uh, they came down with thermometers and found that even if the ground froze within that greenhouse and there was nothing for those thrips to forage on, that they overwintered. So I think we can, we, you know, we have to just be aware that what we don't see doesn't mean it's not there. And fallow, fallow is, you know, it's it's a it was a nice concept, but but its value is has been determined to be less and less. Any final thoughts? I see someone talking about um, my new pirate bug in the text that hasn't been mentioned. That that's a pretty expensive beneficial to buy in, isn't it? That aureus. I'm you know, everybody has their favorite uh, natural enemies. Aureus is not one of my favorites. And it's only because it is expensive. And in our environment, by the time they actually get going so that they're really 
uh, so that they're uh, having an impact, is especially, I'm thinking especially in terms of ornamentals. By the time they're really doing something, the plants are out the door. And so it just has never been worth it to me. It might be worth it for later in the season for your fall crop, but I just don't, I've never found it to be very effective. They're all over the place outside. So if you start de developing sort of a habitat plant system in your, in your greenhouse or in your high tunnel, they'll come in all on their own. So I just, I've never, I've never really felt they were great. But if they're working if for they're, you, I just uh, don't stop. Comment I wanted to yes. make is, is, is viability of this material you're buying in. And, you know, there's been a case made for some, some, some of the product is fresher than others. Um, you should go, you know, you should be able to, when you release, be able to see what you're releasing, make sure it's viable. I have bought Nemesis uh, in the past that was not performing and the block bricks were devoid of, of life and I checked them under a microscope. This stuff is, this stuff is pretty expensive and shipping is even more so. So people should know what they're getting and make sure it's alive. The other thing I noticed one of somebody commented about stuff, you know, there's stuff coming out of Israel. This, these are tiny insects and they're repackaged three or four times before they come to you. So make sure they're viable when they go out and perhaps look to North American suppliers or producers to get, you know, a product that, that is arguably fresher. Great. Well, we've reached the 10 o'clock mark. It was another information packed session. Thank you all for contributing and joining. And Jack Mannix will be leading our call next week at the same time, showing us a variety of greenhouse monitoring systems that he's got in place. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks, Pooh. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Pooh.